Hello and good morning and good afternoon. This is a special early edition of the live PCA. What is normally 3-3, we're going 3 at noon today to kick off the week on this uh, great Monday morning here in D.C. Josh and I are back in the office. This is an optical illusion, folks. We are actually six feet apart right now. Uh, so we thought we would uh, have a really good discussion today. Uh, we're very happy that uh, with our guest today is Corey Baffert, uh, the head of Oliva Cigars. And so we're going to have a really great conversation with Corey, find out uh, more about him and uh, about Oliva and kind of what's been going on during this time for, for them and their company, and also to get his insights on kind of his perspective on the industry, kind of where we're going, and also to get some insights into Oliva and what we can expect to see from them uh, in the coming year. So with that, I will bring up Corey and hey Corey good afternoon how are you doing I'm good how are you guys doing great thanks and as always greetings to our good friend Alan Golden Chicago who's a regular viewer so uh thank you for joining us today and uh we really appreciate you coming on well thanks for having me I appreciate you guys having me on yeah Corey really appreciate it I, I can tell you I, I wanted to reach out Oliva is one of my uh favorite cigars and one of the go-to cigars that uh, Scott and I have here in the office. We're having a, a Series V, and uh, it's a fantastic smoke. So we're really excited to have the opportunity to engage the with you and learn a little bit more about the cigars and uh, your background as the, as the CEO. Um, but I think first and foremost, to kick it off, how are you holding up during the crisis? You know, what steps are, are you taking as a, a company and how are you spending your time um, you know, during, during COVID-19? Well, uh, you know, as you know, this is all new trying times for all of us. I mean, not just the cigar industry globally, it's, uh, it's a very big challenge in business and personal lives and everything. Uh, we're holding up well, uh, you know, pretty much from the get go, uh, Miami Dade was one of the first to, to shut down the County and we were in a stay in place order, but, uh, you know, most of our people are working from home. We have about four or five of us that uh, are in the office uh, every day. And then we have split shifts for um, our our warehouse. So if one person goes down in one shift, we can quarantine them in another 14 for 14 days and we don't lose the, the ability to ship. Um, we put in some social distancing standards in Nicaragua, um, sanitation and everything. We really haven't lost even one, one day of of working in Nicaragua, thank God for That's us, great. because uh, you know they we just it hasn't been a problem in Nicaragua, so to speak, or, or as far as we can tell, uh, we haven't had anybody uh, report being sick at our clinic or anything like that. But we're all holding up pretty well. I mean, as you know, most of our sales guys are for the most part probably like eighty five percent shelved uh, while they're at the stay at home order. Um, we have a couple places where they don't have as restrictive uh, measures in place where you, you know, your movement and things of that nature aren't as restricted. So um, it's interesting times. I know it's hard for store owners and, and everything, uh, but I would say it's, it's, it's interesting to see like uh, uh, just how it's all evolving. You know, uh, I mean, stores that didn't have websites or putting up websites. Uh, I mean, I don't know that, curbside pickup will go away after this. It seems like uh, that's that's actually driving considerable amounts of business. Uh, liquor stores, where, where, where stores are closed, there's liquor stores open, they're able to sell cigars. I think we're actually seeing uh, more people get into premium cigars for the first time as well. So, um, you know, I think we're starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel on this thing. Some parts of the country are, are opening faster than others, but I think we've begun to see uh, some hope on the horizon as far as when this all ends. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, you know, Corey, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to the role at Oliva as, as the chief operator or ex chief executive officer? Well, um, I've kind of been the, uh, the, the story of like, uh, the person that starts in the mail room and ends up as a CEO of a company, to be honest with you, uh, I joined the company. 2006 as uh, just a normal uh, salesperson. Uh, first one in the uh, the upper Midwest, Illinois, uh, Missouri, Kansas, Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin were my, my states. Uh, subsequently moved to Florida, became a rep down there, and then moved into key accounts, and then the vice president. Is, and then as you know, uh, our uh, 
former owner and CEO Jose Oliva became speaker of House of Florida. Yeah. So I took over for him uh, beginning of last year when he moved into that role. And had you had any uh, premium cigar or tobacco background before you joined Oliva back in 2006? Well, in 2006, uh, I actually came from Cigar.com. Uh, they had been purchased by Cigars International. So prior to that, I worked for them for three and a half years. And prior to that, I was 23 years old. So <laughs> my whole professional career has been in the cigar business. Great. It's been a hell of a ride, I got to say. Yeah, I find that more and more for most people. Once they get in, it's it's there's so much to love about it. It's really difficult to leave. Like you know, you not even if you want to, right? You're just like, no, nah, I'm I'm staying. It's a family. It's my life. It's kind of the way that it goes. So uh, that's more common than I've found than not. Um, we do have our obligatory comment. It's funny how people make these comments um, uh, whenever we do these shows, mostly about people's grooming standards or dress standards when during quarantine. I mean, Kelly Shea talks about the fact you got the quarantine beard, but your hair looks good. I just want to compliment your style because, you know, the way that obviously the head is shiny and the face is well groomed. You have great style, Corey. I think it's coming across very well. Yeah, you know, actually, uh, I'll be honest with you. I, I This predates my cigar days. Uh, you know, I just <laughs> felt it's a cleaner look. Uh, it's more sanitary. Uh, you know, it, it lends the, you know, I, I'm able to control how I look from day to day better than most people. Yeah, I've uh, I've probably worn this phrase out too often, but uh, I don't know if you say the same thing or not. But I always tell people I'm not bald; I'm just taller than my hair. So you there you know, go, man. There there you go. Go. Use that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's got a haircut. Yeah, I, I, I got. He's got a nice set of hair over there, man. I mean, you can't really fault that guy for keeping something around. Oh, like I know. That. It it looked terrible on Friday. I had I've been doing. We have a few of these interviews scheduled for this week and next week, and I'm like. I need a haircut. So I had a friend come and, and do it because it was, uh, I, I looked, I was telling people I looked like a, a backup singer for the Beatles. That was Listen, the look that I, I got to tell you, man, if I had your hair, I'd run for president. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that's funny. We were going to, we had a, um, you know, you mentioned the websites. We did a, um, uh, a retailer sort of website and how you can use that to help bring more customers to your store on Thursday. Dave Garofalo was one of our guests. And so there was a good conversation we had about him using the Flowbee. And he'd been using the Flowbee, he said, for 30 years. So I was about ready to order him one until he was able to get a friend come and cut his hair. I mean, hey, listen, uh, we're, you know, uh, what, 12, 15 years ago, the my iPhone didn't exist. I, you know, they're coming along. With it. I'm sure the Flowbee is way, way more advanced than when it initially came out. I mean, they're probably at version 8.0 at this point. I mean, yeah. you know, you probably don't have to empty the bag as often. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe now it just goes right into some sort of compost heap that helps you grow vegetables out back. That's it, man. That's it. So long as long it's life. Good, good hello to a, a, a great friend of ours, Kurt Kendall. He says hello as well. So, so Corey, how, how would you describe the Oliva brand and its position within the premium cigar industry? Well, you know, I mean, it's got a lot of the Cuban heritage to it. Uh, you know, when I started with this company, uh, Nicaraguan was just kind of just sort of sort of kind of getting on the map, so to speak. Uh, you know, everybody was all about Dominican cigars uh, at the time. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, I always thought that that, you know, Nicaraguan tobacco was very much more uh, similar to to Cuban tobacco. And uh, back, you know, as, as a as a times of change and things of that, I think uh, the market came more towards us uh over time and you know we we're more of the we have a little bit of everything that fits with no matter what smoker you are uh we even have some innovative things and in nub and cane uh that you know kind of lend to the whole uh you know uh, less mainstream a little bit outside the box kind of uh kind of cigars yeah i will say that uh, uh years 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 ago it was the special g and uh, I was in my local tobacconist here, J.B. Hayes. Um, it, it's no longer there. And uh, I was looking through the humidor, and I saw, obviously, the Olivas. But then down, just it was uh, the humidor was on the wall, and then there was a little bit of a display just underneath that. And I saw the special G's in there. And I was like, I'd never seen something like that before. And so I scooped up, you know, a handful. And that became a pretty regular for me when the weather was nice. I would go outside for my lunch break and that was a perfect lunchtime cigar. And that's, that was one of those things to where I was like, Oh, nice, short, quick cigars. These are great. So then to your point, they're kind of the non sort of, uh, sort of mainstream cigars. That's what the first one that I had smoked that was like that. And it was a great, you know, yeah, fantastic. 
Corey, you mentioned that you, you know, you started in the sales side of the, the business. How did those skills equip you for the position that you have now? And, you know, what career advice do you have for folks that are in the premium cigar industry or looking <clears throat> for a career in the premium cigar industry? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, with any job, I would say, you know, you want to like enjoy what you do. You know, I think that's first and foremost, uh, you know, people tend to love cigars when they get in this business. But I think, uh, you know, I did start, you know, with a tobacconist and then went to selling to tobacconists. So I kind of followed the, you know, the mold of, or the, the pattern of how you get there. You know, you start kind of learn cigars in a cigar shop. Then you, you know, make the jump if you can to, uh, you know, a manufacturer, try to try to learn that side of the business. And then you kind of go from there. You know, some people like to be in marketing. Some people like to be in the, you know, uh, the, the operational side of, of cigars. You know, we see a lot of our sales guys, but, you know, there's a lot of people uh, behind the scenes that you don't usually see too often at the, you know, the, the cigar festivals and, and events and things that, that are really where, you know, uh, they make things happen behind the scenes. It's kind of a thankless job compared to where, you know, you have the sales guys that are always doing the events and everybody sees them. Those are the guys are the face. Uh, but there's a lot of people, you know, at our factory. Uh, they're very, very important to the success of our company that uh, really, you know, making a cigar isn't, you know, just a few people. It's, you know, we have 2,500 people in Nicaragua that, you know, make our brand come to life. You know, uh, if you, it just depends on what type of, uh, you know, what type of business you want to be in. If you went to college to be an accountant, you know, there's jobs for accountant, you know, accounting jobs in the cigar business and everything else that you can be around, you know, so. I would say if you want to get into this business, find out what you love to do first. Uh, and then secondly, uh, you know, go from there. I mean, uh, the cigar business, you know, has its challenges as well. I mean, we have a lot, you know, we face, but uh, it certainly helps to be in something you enjoy every day, to do every day. Yeah, and I think to kind of your point there, number one, it, it's very much like uh, the iceberg, right? And a lot of businesses like that. But in this instance, there's so many things that are below that surface in the background, like you just talked about that really kind of make it go, but you only really see a handful of those that kind of interface. I think that underscores a couple of things. Number one, the importance of the people behind the brand, but number two, it also underscores the importance for those that are actually putting on the face of your brand and how important it is for them too, to, to maintain sort of those qualities and those standards as well, because really, really long story or old story here. Um, there's a Franklin Covey company and back in the day that they went cheap on their receptionist and someone met with them. He's like, wow, I, Kudos to you for hiring a receptionist that doesn't really speak English. He's like, what are you talking about? He said, I called and asked for something. And he said, well, we ain't got none of them. And he's like, I can hardly understand her. And he said, I realized that that receptionist was our gateway to the world. And so now we pay a premium for the best receptionist we can possibly find uh, because it is very much. And this was long before the days of, of websites and everything else. Um, Gary Pesh has a, a funny comment here, but I think it kind of underscores a little bit of what you're talking about. He says, you know, the best way to make a million dollars in the premium industry is to start with two. Right. And, and I think that there's a lot to what you're talking about, find out what you're good at, but align that with the passion that you would have, because it's going to take that passion because there are more challenges that confront this industry than confront most. Um, so, I, you know, I think to your point, um, your passion, I think, is helped propel you forward. Uh, is that something that you think is a necessity or is it something you think somebody can find when coming into the cigar industry? Or do you think they have to have it beforehand? Actually, I think it's a. Uh... You know, I think really truthfully, I mean, I can tell you there's a lot of nights that I spent on the road, you know, when this was a very small company that, uh, you know, you got to have the drive, you know, you got to have the ambition that you want to succeed no matter what. I mean, that's in any business you're in. Um, but, you know, being out on the road, seeing something, uh, you know, in its in its infant stages become some become a, a, a large, you know, thing is kind of like a, something you take pride in, but uh, having the drive and getting out there and and, and, and and going after the challenges, you know, with a positive attitude, I mean, I think that absolutely is uh, key and crucial to succeed. Uh, but just to get into this business, I think some people, you know, they, they think they want to be in the cigar business and, and you know, maybe it's not for them because, I, I you know, as, as great as it is, it comes with its challenges, you know, with the anti-smoking legislation, the FDA, uh, you know, but all in all, I would just say, you know, altogether, even with the COVID-19, uh, there's, 
you can look at everything negatively, but if you put a positive spin on it and, and you know, use it as a way to springboard your brand or, or your business, I think it's, I think it's the, the best way. This is a, it's a great opportunity to, you know, when, when have you ever been able to stop your business in motion and kind of take a look from top to bottom and see how you can improve and, and even like do things in a new, new, new way. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, as far as that, ambition is, is definitely number one. I, I, if you want to get into it, try your best. That's all I got to say. Yeah. It, it, that actually is, is an excellent point. It reminds me uh, a few years ago, uh, I was reading this, this Harvard study and then listening to the subsequent interview with the author. And he talked about the fact of what they noticed is that successful when they talk about passion, it's, it's in the output we're not the input, right? So if cigars are your passion, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate into success. I think your point is, is very well made there is that it's the output, right? I want to, I want to take a brand. I want to see it flourish. I want to take a product and see it come to fruition and see it flourish and connect with customers. It's that output where people find the passion, the fulfillment. And so I think that that was articulated very well by you. I think, you know, one of the important things to note in this COVID-19 um, crisis that we're in is the amount of adaption, innovation, and resiliency that we've seen in the premium cigar industry. Absolutely. New ideas, people coming together, people talking about solutions, you know, retailers and manufacturers working on partnerships. Um, so, you know, I think on that side, it's been refreshing. You know, from our personal standpoint, it's been great to have the ability to engage with key stakeholders such as yourself and broadcasts like this to learn more about the industry um, and, and get the different vantage points. And if you look at the catalog of what now we're 20, 30 interviews deep, there's different perspectives, there's different ideas um, and, and different mindsets of, of all of the, the folks that we've uh, put together. And I'm curious, you know, you guys kind of segued this next question. Corey, what do you believe is the greatest threat to the premium cigar industry and how do we overcome that threat? Well, really quick, I do want to add a little bit of a, a positive uh, note to this. I do believe uh, in uh, while we're going through all of this, I think we're going to come out of this thing uh, better as an industry. And I'm going to tell you why. I think uh, right now people are at home trying to find things to do. Uh, and I believe wholeheartedly if they have any avenue of trying a cigar for the first time that it's happening now more than it's ever happened. So I think when this all ends, I think it's going to be long run better for our industry to, there's going to be tons of new premium cigar smokers because it's been a challenge for us. Uh, as far as threats are concerned, I mean, I don't think there's any question that the federal government or state governments are number one threat. You know, I mean, uh, whether it's the FDA, whether it's the, uh, you know, the S chip, you know, it comes up and, and they want to raise taxes on that, whether it's states uh, enacting, you know, egregious taxes uh, to overcome overblown budgets, uh, smoking bans, you know, uh, it just never ends for us. You know, I mean, when people say they want to be in the cigar business, I will tell you that, that yes, it has its pros, but it certainly has its cons. And I would say the uh, you have to you have to really have thick armor uh, to be in this business and, and understand that there's a lot you can't control individually but i do believe uh you know our business collectively we can do a lot i mean be involved you know like uh you know the the cigar rights of america and the pca are two great examples of being involved and in, and in, in trying to uh fend off that that attack from the from the government and state and local and and federal uh but certainly without a doubt that's the number one the number one obstacle and threat to our industry yeah, it's frustrating because when you look at most other industries, they face challenges of producing inventory, innovating in a correct way, fulfilling gaps, understanding customer needs, being able to adapt uh, appropriately or pivot or, or meet market needs, um, finding funding and things like that, right? Coming out with the next version. And for the cigar industry, it's, it's so frustrating because I, I see how well it could flourish and grow if we could just get that massive monkey off of our back. Yeah. And I, and I look, I think uh, we've got some great, you know, again, positive, you know, we won the the case for warning labels, you know, right. uh, we have a, a, you know, a case coming in June where we're, we're, we're basically talking about, we, 
and admittedly, the FDA said we're not a threat to children or family. We, young people don't have access to, to premium cigars. And the more and more we separate ourselves from cigarettes, chewing tobacco, vape, and everything else that really, really gets the bad rap, I think people realize this is more of like, you know, uh, a hobbyist, uh, an enjoyable thing that, that's not abused, you know? And yeah. I think maybe, hopefully, I guess maybe I'm just uh, – you know, I'm more positive about things, but I think hopefully if we all band together and, you know, try to attack this thing head on collectively, I think we, we have better days ahead. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we've been uh, working hand in hand with the Cigar Rights of America and been progressing this legislative policy agenda forward uh, at an increasing pace, especially over the past six, to eight months and making significant progress. Part of that progress, just to underscore your point here, has been the vast amounts of education series, the meetings with everybody within the administration from the White House, Health and Human Services, the FDA, so the various administrative uh, groups that oversee this policy, as well as then the legislative uh, groups between uh, the House and the Senate. And what's what's great is we're starting to make significant headway for them to understand what our industry is really about. One of the really interesting things, and, and, and I want to kind of reiterate this, I've said it a few times, but when White House counsel actually said this to us, that it's really interesting looking at the FDA's approach to us versus other products. With other products, they're concerned about the usage, and that's what they cite as the challenge going forward, right? The youth access, youth addiction, et cetera. With us, you know, they understand because it's pretty well accepted and established that there is no youth access or, or addiction problem with premium cigars. But for whatever reason, they focus on the product, whereas on the other hand, they don't focus on their products, right? Right. So, uh, but the other part that's been really great is we're starting to get good foundations of understanding, uh, particularly within places like the FDA, the Office of Stakeholder Relations, where they say, look, our story of small businesses, particularly our mom and pop shops and the tobacconists and the retailers that are out there, um, carries a lot of weight. And it was resonating. That message is resonating because it's very, very different to your point of the entirety of the other industries and how they are both produced and promulgated and sold. So to your point, I'm also, I'm one of those, maybe it's the, the bald head and the beard, but I very much uh, share that optimism that better and brighter days are ahead for us. And I believe that we've got made some such great progress that we are on the precipice of being able to kind of change things for the, the, the premium cigar industry. Yeah. But that being said, we can never let up. I mean, no, it, no. When when the FDA, maybe if the maybe we get we get a win on the FDA, what's next? You know, I mean, they're always becoming us because the truth is, it's tobacco that we sell. Exactly, uh, you know, it's not the harmful constituents that they put in cigarettes and everything. But uh, yeah, I agree. It's I think we've got better days ahead when it comes to all that. And and the battle's never going to be over, or the war's never going to be over. It's just going to be a series of battles, and that's why, to your point, I think. The, we've been able to, to construct this foundation and now we can consistently launch these battles, right? Be more proactive and go after them, particularly at the local level, which is where we see most of these challenges start and then percolate up. Um, I do want to give real quick, you know, uh, recognition here. We are, we've got people watching from uh, Afghanistan all oh. the way to the, the, to uh, our good friend, Valerie in Regina, Saskatchewan, and then even in Portland, Oregon and Joel Rundle, uh, in Washington. So we're global here, Corey, you're, you're bringing in a global audience. Wow. That's uh, great to see the people in Afghanistan, man. You guys keep up the good work over there. We really, I mean, it, it's an honor to, to have you, you know, watching, you know, us here in the United States. I know everything you do over there is a tremendous sacrifice for us and I'm flattered that you're here and honored. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Shout out for cigars for warriors. Uh, you know yeah. the folks that get get cigars to the troops, and I think that that's you know incredible work. Um, Just real quick, sorry, but that's actually an important part of the premium cigar pipe industry as well. Of our story is how much it's appreciated by those that are serving this country. We've right. heard numerous times from those who have served in the military that you know if they're over, whether it, particularly in, in countries where alcohol is not allowed. For them to be able to come back and enjoy a cigar, and especially for those that I know this is it's you know taboo or whatever the case may be because of tobacco twenty one, but even those that would not be of age in order to drink alcohol, even being able to sit back at the end of the day and decompress with a cigar amongst your fellow soldiers is so important to so many, and that's a part of our story that is resonating very well as uh, also. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Well, and, and Corey, you know, you definitely um, have been very active uh, across the board with CRA and PCA. And, you know, we just engaged in a uh, discussion uh, a few weeks ago with the Small Business Committee uh, on different re relief mechanisms. You know, our audience, we have consumers, retailers, manufacturers. You mentioned, you know, the involvement in those two organizations. What specifically can you know, consumers of Oliva do to support the brand, but also support the greater premium cigar industry? Well, I mean, I think they could, uh, you know, be a Cigar Rights of America, you know, uh, membership, uh, purchase the, uh, you know, the packs, all that money goes directly towards the fight. Uh, you know, purchasing them at, a, you know, the PCA stores that are selling those, those packs. Uh, writing, writing their local or uh, federal legislators when asked. Um, those are the biggest things. I think it, uh, just being active and, and reading up on it and understanding when is the point to, you know, get, put your, your, you know, wheel hit, or your hat, hat in the ring when you're, you know, the time is right. The time is right. We'll, we'll call and ask, Hey, we need your help. We need your support. And when it's time, you know, be there, you know, uh, but you know, just being engaged is probably the number one way because when you're engaged, you can understand that the whole fight and when when it's time to you know to to get your hat in the ring. So, you know, definitely writing and and, and if you can be a member of CRA or you can you know uh, purchase the samplers. So those are small ways, but uh, collectively, again, I mean, it's it's a it's a small thing, but they all add up to one big thing. Yeah. I the importance of engagement is critical because while you might live in a pretty tobacco friendly state, you might see a fight in another state to where, you know, we work and we defeat a smoking ban or tax increase or something along those lines, or a tax increase ends up happening somewhere. For example, it's important to stay engaged because as we saw with tobacco 21, if it starts in one place, especially when it comes to taxes, if other state legislators start learning of other places trying to do cash grabs on the back of tobacco, they'll start to do the same thing. These guys talk, they network the same way that we do within our industry and every other industry. So it's important to stay engaged because even if it does seem like it's far away from home, it really is only a matter of time before it shows up on your front doorstep. So if you are engaged in learning about those battles, then it's a lot easier than to activate when it's needed in order to fight that successfully on your own home front. Yeah, I mean, look, Everybody thinks that, you know, oh, my vote doesn't count. But when it comes down to somebody like Matt Bevin losing, you know, the governor of Kentucky by thousands of votes or hell, right. W. Bush winning Florida by less than a thousand. Yeah. Uh, when you look at it on that level and, and, and house districts and all that, I mean, we're, we're talking about a very, very polarized uh, America right now where, you know, there's not a lot of shift outside of about 4%. And when you're talking about cigar smokers, decide to be a single issue voter, uh, that can make a huge difference. And it, there's no Democrat or Republican. We all love cigars. There's nothing yeah. about either either party there that's, that it is what it is. And quite frankly, I'd support anybody that's going to be, well, all right. <laughs> <Not really. laughs> but I would say when it comes down to local issues and things like statewide, I think it's, it's, it's easy to say, look, if this person supports me and my business or my, my, what I love to do, then I think that that's uh, the issue that I'm going to vote on. You know, some of the other stuff is, you know, too, too macro, you know, and yeah. you know, we get caught up in things that really are never going to affect our lives personally. But this is an issue that if you really love to do it, it can really, really make a big difference that if you get involved personally, because your one vote, I mean, it really adds up. You know, one single cigar store could, you know, could get hundreds of votes for a local congressman. And when you look at how yes. close these races are these days, uh, it's it could be the difference. Yeah. And I think that one of the most dangerous and pernicious fallacies that exists among the, the populace is I can't make a difference. My vote doesn't matter, as you said. And on a local issue, especially when you're dealing with state representatives and getting involved in the community level, your influence actually has significant impact because what they're looking at is how many friends do you have? How many family members do you have? Are, you know, you have businesses, you pay taxes, your one vote isn't just held in a vacuum. And they're looking at that as a community basis, right? And particularly nowadays when it's very easy for communities to connect virtually and digitally. 
And so uh, that's one thing that we're trying to underscore is the people still have the power. It's just a matter of being able to do it, to, to activate it and to address it and focus it smartly. Right. And listen, I hate when people tell me that their vote doesn't count. It doesn't matter because I mean, uh, you know, there's tell the guy in Afghanistan that, that, that statement, that's, 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 right. it's not, it's, that is just that's. I think it's your duty as a citizen to get out of bed and go vote. And they make it so accessible to vote nowadays that everybody should vote. I can't believe we don't get ninety five percent participation rate when it comes to voting. But when it comes to cigars and everything else, we have so many issues that just even the lo most local level where we're talking about a uh, an alderman in the city, you know, outlawing tobacco in Beverly Hills and things of that nature. Yeah. You can really, really make a huge difference. And if you and five of your friends that are cigar smokers can really make an absolute difference. So, you know, voting is, I think, your duty as an American to do. And if you are a cigar smoker, it's double duty because it's needed. And they're always on the attack when it comes to, to premium cigars. Absolutely. And, you know, we have a lot of power when you look at states like Pennsylvania and Florida, yeah. which are battleground states continuously. Oh, no. And those are the strongest states for the premium cigar industry. So, you know, it, it, it is important that, you know, for the folks that are watching this to share it with their friends, share it with uh, colleagues. We really need to build that capacity as you both correctly pointed out. I think the, the challenge in 2021 is going to be across the board, whether it's federal, state or local, tax policies yeah. like there are revenue vacuums um that will need to be filled and you know sin taxes so to speak are always the low-hanging fruit and um you know we're gonna have to be vigilant and active and mobilize uh continuously um the through the remainder of this year and into next year for sure yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can say here in Florida, you know, when we Governor Santos has been very, very uh he's all about our cause. He's, you know, he's brought yeah, up the executive exactly. branch, but it's a bipartisan issue as far as I'm concerned, because we've got some Democrats in Florida that are really helping us as well. So, uh, you know, like I said, this is a, this is a single issue voter. If you're a single issue voter, go out and just vote for that single issue. And it could be, it doesn't mean if it's Democrat or, or Republican, because there's, it's a bipartisan on both sides of it. And there's Republicans that don't like tobacco and then there's Democrats that don't like tobacco and then vice versa. Exactly. For sure. Well, let's shift a little bit over to the Oliva Cigar Suite, um, the different cigars that you guys have. Um, you know, Scott and I are enjoying a, a Series V Double Robusto um, right now. Can you tell us a little bit about that cigar in particular and some of the other ones that you are personally really excited about? or some of the uh, new projects that you guys have been working on? Well, we don't do a tremendous amount of new projects, to be honest with you. That's one of the things about our company. We like to, uh, you know, solidify our brand amongst, uh, you know, the lines that we and just keep expanding those. So we're not, you know, we like to keep the road, you know, uh, more like straight instead of all over the place. But uh, we like to, the, the V is, really our flagship line uh, was our initial flagship line that was, uh, a full or full bodied cigar, very smooth, uh, more of the Cuban like uh, taste and flavors uh, with the, the Jalapa, you know, the Jalapa filler. So it's a strong cigar, but it doesn't just attack the palate, you know, so to speak. And then we, you know, we realized that not everybody likes a full bodied cigar and all the time. So then we came up with our, our Serie D Melania, which is more a medium to medium full bodied cigar, uh, flat press. That's what I'm smoking now. It's a little more approachable at all hours. Uh, you know, uh, if I smoke a beach generally in the evening after dinner with, uh, you know, with a nice whiskey or uh, I personally like wine. So <laughs> with the nice red wine yeah. and uh, but, you know, the Melania is the one that got the cigar of the year in 2014 by Cigar Fishing Auto Magazine. Uh, but both V and V Milani are routinely uh, in the top of the ratings of Cigar Aficionado. It's our, our most premium tobaccos are, you know, and the standards of quality on those are very, very, very high. So we, we keep our best rollers for those cigars and we're constantly, uh, you know, making sure that those, those are the, the right people rolling those cigars. I'll tell you, it's a challenge when you, when you're you know you're a company that's growing. It's always been a real challenge to continue the level of quality, uh, you know, while trying to in, 
uh, you know, produce more to, to, to bring more to market. And, you know, over the years, you know, we can't just ramp up those, the production on those cigars and, and, and heavy quantity in a quick pace. You know, it's taken years and years and years to get to where we are to not today. Uh, years and years of having bare shelves when it comes to those products, because we just didn't want to rush them to market, you know? Uh, so, you know, we've, we've expanded our factories and, and, and invested in tobacco and manpower and things of that nature without sacrificing the quality because we put in extra safe, uh, standards uh, to make sure that nothing is sacrificed along the way. I think that's an interesting point. A lot of, you know, novice cigar smokers would be interested to hear a little bit more. Is what does the quality control process look like for a premium cigar, you know, how does it, what are the steps, you know, in, in, in looking at it to get it to the shelf to where I'm enjoying it? Well, first of all, uh, it's an interesting thing with, uh, with, with the Siri V, uh, was the first time we actually used salaried rollers for it. Now, why does that make a difference? Uh, with other cigars in our factory, it's what you roll, you get per cigar is how you're paid. So we, we did that experiment because we wanted them to slow down and make sure that they weren't rushing anything. Uh, but generally, uh, salaried isn't how you uh, run a, a cigar factory. You don't do it that way. Um, and then there's, you know, shades of color. There's uh, imperfections in the wrapper. It, it goes through about four or five uh, processes after it's rolled to make sure that when it goes into age, it's okay. When it comes out of age, when it goes into packing, there's all these different parameters we have set forth and uh, each one signs off on it. We have scanners. We, you know, we're, we're very, very uh, digitalized when it comes to the information we have internally. Uh, so we can, we can track how far it got along the way before it got rejected. So as you go, less and less and less gets rejected because, you know, you had more hands and more, more eyes looking at it. But uh, another interesting, another interesting uh, story to go with our, our Milano Figurado, that's a very difficult cigar to roll. Uh, and really, to be honest with you, the only way that cigar is actually going to smoke is if it's rolled perfectly. So we have very few rollers in our factory that can actually do that cigar. So, uh, you know, over the years, we've, you know, we basically make sure that, you know, we train them. And it takes a tremendous amount of years for people to be able to, to reach the level of V&V Milano level quality of rolling. And even still, we have the highest acceptable level of rejects uh, for those just because we want it to be perfect when it, when it goes into a box and out to the stores. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm getting flashes. I mean, again, it wouldn't be a PCA live show if I didn't make a pop culture reference, but it just, it reminds me of that Seinfeld episode where they bring in the guys to roll the crepes, right? <laughs> so for you bringing the, the high level of, of expertise when it comes to rolling. And I think it would, uh, anybody who has never gone on a factory tour, and I know that there are even virtual tours, but just to truly see how everything goes from the care from the planting and the farming and then the aging and curing the tobacco, then to bringing it in and the washing and going through the fermentation process and everything else to then how you decide and you select and you go through and then it's all put together and then going through the rolling to test it, the, the airflow through it and all the, every single step, the meticulous nature that it takes for a premium cigar to actually come to market is so in depth. I it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's so compelling because there's very few other industries when their products are coming out like that, particularly one to where you have, there are so many that are coming out right together, right? You can maybe look at that. Okay. Uh, you know, computers go through testing processes or cars or automobiles, things that even have high safety standards where they're going to have to be out and operated and things like that. But with the cigar, the amount of atten the amount of attention to detail is so high that I think it would do everybody a great service to go and they do a virtual tour of a factory and that whole process just speaks to kind of what we often talk about why this industry is so very, very different than anything else that claims or does use tobacco leaf within their products. Yeah. In fact, I think if you at, were able to somehow teleport every single uh, politician to Nicaragua or Honduras or Dominican yeah. and give them a, a, an idea of what premium cigars are, well, you'd kind of see what a Lamborghini is compared to a lawnmower, you know, like, Sure. There's a lot sure. of components to make a Lamborghini what it is. Precision, uh, you know, tension to quality, 
you know, it's not a rough situation where you just pull string and you, you cut a bunch. No, no, this thing goes, um, you know, 180 miles an hour and it only does it because it's precision, uh, the quality and everything like that. I think people would realize, wow, this is not a, this is not something that's in any way, shape or form outside of, you know, five or six leaves put together and make it look like this. It's very impressive that we can make a cigar look that good because it's truly just a, just some leaves put together and molded. And then, you know, you have a band on it, but they can make it look so beautiful that I think if more and more people were able to see what goes into a, a cigar, you, first of all, you'd probably be surprised it's not $80 a cigar. <laughs> you know, exactly. That's, exactly. That's number one. But number two, it's just, you can really, uh, come to, to really respect what a, a premium cigar is. Yeah. I, to underscore that, I just want to show this comment from Valerie when she did a tour, uh, talking about somebody who was counting the leaves. And uh, one of the factors employed a visually impaired person to actually count the leaves. And again, underscoring, there's so many people, it's again, going back to that metaphor of the, the iceberg, so many people behind the scenes that are keeping that, you know, and, and moving it, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it really, I mean, even sorting, uh, you know, color, I mean, there's just so much that goes into it that, you know, it, that people just don't understand, you know, like a wrapper can take nine months to a year to be ready. And it's just constantly flipping, maintaining the temperature. Uh, it, it takes it's so much work uh, that, it, like I said, it's amazing we we're able to, to make it look so beautiful and, and actually affordable in the United States. It's, it's really interesting. We use the phrase, you know, it's an artisanal product. And yeah. you know, we use that on our collateral. We use it in our meetings. And I think sometimes unless you sit there and, you know, listen to experts such as yourself or go on a factory tour, that phrase, you know, it just goes over everybody because the complexity of it, um, that quality control aspect is, um, you know, really amazing when you put all the pieces together. And I think that that's one of the things that we're trying to showcase through the, you know, whether it's a online series or we do, you know, in normal times, the live events here, try to walk people through that process and give them a semblance of what actually, what it actually takes to, you know, produce a premium cigar so that, you know, people not only understand it better, but they cherish it when, when they are enjoying a, a premium cigar. And I think that goes back to even again, that informs the consumer behavior behind it. Because consumers aren't going into, again, looking at something like cigarettes. They're not wondering how the cigarettes are made. They're not wondering what years or farms or factories or who blended and who did what. They are looking for something to get nicotine into their system as quickly as possible. They don't right. care about flavor, right? This is something that's so entirely different that the process also informs the consumer behavior about how the product is actually enjoyed and to what degree. You know, Vartan Safarian, one of our uh, former board members, great tobacconist out in Arizona, ambassador of fine cigars. He did a, a little live post a couple of days ago where he's talking about he hadn't been to his shop and he hadn't smoked in, he said, 46 days. And for him, he said, I just want to make sure that you understand that it shows that premium cigars are not addictive because he said, I haven't had one in 46 days. And that's to that point, right? If, yeah. And a lot of people like to have a particular set of circumstances when they can enjoy a cigar, how they enjoy it, just like you said. I enjoy this particular cigar with the red wine, et cetera, et cetera. So it, 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 the process, I think, is so important and why we've been so adamant in teaching the, the, this entire, the entirety of the industry to folks on Capitol Hill because, because of that very fact. Exactly. I mean, I can tell you there's, there's a couple of things I do after the PCA trade show every year. I get a dental cleaning and I don't smoke cigars for two weeks, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, like I, I, I'm not really enjoying it so much anymore. You know, I really want to go the other way with it. I want to take a little break and reset, you know? 100%. I was the same thing after my first TA. I was like, oh my God, that's like 30 some odd cigars over the course of like five days. I, I need a break. So it, it was a, yeah, it was a few weeks before I was like, yeah, okay, let me go back so I can get that enjoyment and that experience again. Really good question from uh, Valerie Bradshaw again here is about uh, in terms of kind of insurance or contingency plans, uh, what if something comes along that wipes out the field or something along those lines? Is you just write the crop off or? Uh, well, you know, it's to be honest with you, uh, we don't really in, in do insurance uh, on that. Um, we just try to make measures to where we don't mitigate entire crop uh, fields or you know, in different regions of the, and whatnot, if there's a blue mold problem, it may occur in multiple regions, 
But if there is an entire crop wiped out, I will tell you one thing we've done is invested in enough tobacco to last a year and a half at least on our end uh, we could continue at the same pace and and hopefully it's not two years straight of crop uh yeah uh, you know problems with crops but you know one thing we face uh, that people don't really know too much about is you know the political uncertainty in central america you know right. uh, yeah. we have a lot of that down there i mean we've got you know the the growing conditions everybody's kind of uh, they've over the years they've known how to mitigate some of the 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 blue mold and the, the pest problems and things of that nature uh, that's been mitigated pretty, pretty good. Uh, but as far as like, uh, you know, in 2018, we, we had some issues with uh, the uprising uh, with the government in Nicaragua and that presented a challenge for us. Uh, but I will tell you this, you know, it is interesting to know that um, the cigar makers in, in, in Nicaragua and I assume other, other countries, they, they take a lot of pride in their, in their, where they work too. Uh, we pay them and treat them very well. Um, and they, they, you know, I would say our factory is probably 50, 50 ones pro government, pro non-government, but they all pitched in and made sure that nothing happened to our factory. Cause it was like their second home to them. Yeah. And uh, so there, you know, there's some challenges we all face as an industry, but you know, like not just, you know, people here in the United States love our brand, our people over there do as well. Yeah, I think that that's also part of that whole sense of, of community. I think at every level, from even just a few factories I've been able to visit and the operations I've seen, is that from they all have that same sense of community, right? And I've seen where our lunch breaks people from all over. They're all eating together, laughing. I mean, it, very much that sense of community exists throughout, all the way through to the consumer, right? And so I, I think that the entirety of the, the cigar family is really very much a community or premium tobacco, I'd say, because it's the same thing with pipes. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's just, I, I mean, people, I mean, they love, they love where they work there too. I mean, uh, Esteli kind of where the roadblocks ended <laughs> and they were allowed, we were allowed to get our shipments out of Honduras through the, awesome. the northern border. Corey, you mentioned enjoying wine. Um, what is your go-to cigar pairing, your cigar selection and wine pairing that you celebrate a success with? Uh, man. You know, I like French wines, but I'm an American, uh, so I will uh, delve into, uh, you know, uh, I really like Napa wines. You know, I, I do, I enjoy all of them. I mean, it could, you know, even Spanish wines. Well, probably Italy is the least that I know about, but um, I, I, I do enjoy the heck out of, the uh, you know, Nickel, Nickel and, and Farniente. Uh, any Melania with any of those nice big reds. I'm not a huge fan of white wine, personally. To me, it's it's not the same. Uh, and it's just for different moments, you know, I think white wine is more for, uh, you know, like sitting in an outdoor patio in the heat you can have a nice cold, cold glass of white wine. But, uh, but I, I like a nice big red. Yeah. Gary Pesh, Camus. I do. I like Camus, Camus. Uh, although I gotta tell you, I didn't like the last year's vintage that much. Um, but yeah, the, the Forniente is drinking very nicely right, right now. No, nice. Yeah, I do. I, I'm a big fan of French wines. I love Bordeaux. Uh, there's actually a local winery here in Virginia that patterns themselves after making a French style wine. And so they even have, you know, right bank, left bank styles. And it's, um, it's actually pretty good. Um, yeah. sort of my favorite local Virginia wine. And so uh, I definitely make sure to continue to purchase from them. I visited some wineries uh, up the coast of uh, Auckland, New Zealand, man. They've got some really nice wines out there. A beautiful, beautiful uh, island called Wahiki Island off the coast of uh, Auckland. It's a little ferry ride out there. Beautiful, beautiful. And it really, man, it really is like the closest thing to, to, to cigars when you come to that side. You know, I wish we were able to grow tobacco here and make, you know, big chateaus so that people come visit us and things like that. Yeah. Unfortunately, it just doesn't, the climate and, and uh, doesn't lend to the to that extent. But, uh, but yeah, definitely wine is probably the closest, in my opinion, to another industry that's like ours. And, and even better, no feet ever step on the tobacco leaves. It's just hands, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it was funny, Corey, when we were promoting the, uh, the interview, I, I think I had the most number of comments of folks that talked about experiences with Oliva and like it, it and described it really as an experience smoke, whether it was golfing, fishing, shooting, different activities that they would pair with having a, a different Oliva. And I thought that was really interesting that, you know, in the, 
the connected industry, so to speak, that you, you guys have such a large following where people basically have their own individual associated activity where they enjoy an Oliva. Well, I'd love to be a part of people's uh, experiences. I mean, I, you know, I, when I'm, when I'm meeting people for the first time, even in my personal life, you know, and they say, Oh man, you work for Oliva. Uh, I, you know, it's the same thing. It's, it's a tremendous honor that the flattery that they would tell me that, the, you know, that, that that's what they smoked at their wedding or, or that they, you know, enjoyed with their uh, dad for the first time when they, you know, sat down and smoked a cigar. I mean, some people uh, would, you know, I've had people come up to me at events and tell me that like, my father, before he passed away, we used to enjoy, you know, a Melania or whatever else. I mean, it's very, it's very humbling for me to, to be that our company is really like a part of somebody's life like that. You know, I mean, to me, it's, it's cigars, but to some people it's a, it's, it's experience, you know, and I, I think it's great. Yeah. You know? Very much a uh, celebratory uh, component to the cigars is, is a very important part of the industry. And in fact, the Melania is, uh, one of my good friends, best man at my wedding, when he graduated uh, business school from Kellogg, there's a Milano and a uh, a Balvenie Portwood that uh, was uh, present for me. So good really company, cool. I tell you. So I know the two, the the I know the Scotch and the and the and the cigar. So the guy must have been pretty good too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's a great guy. He now uh, he's now the chief product officer for Boeing. So uh, his career, his career trajectory has been uh, just fine. Uh, yeah, he and his family are uh, close friends. I, I will say I take credit because I, I went to high school with his now wife and I introduced the two of them uh, here when uh, she came out here for law school. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're great people. And, uh, yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, we, we try to uh, we try to like uh, have more of a this is a company, but we within the people here, we try to make it more like a family. Yeah. So, you know, my guys on the road and everybody treats it such, you know, so there is truly passion there when they when they're out at their events and, and meeting customers and and things of that nature it's not just uh it's not just show i mean i got some of these guys man you think that their last name is oliva <laughs> <laughs> well that's great i mean that means look that means yourself source is bought in it's good company culture um valerie did talk about uh, how she had a great time at a, an event in north dakota in the events you put on um just with the last few minutes here what what sort of the kind of the philosophy behind your events in terms of having a good time and being able to showcase a brand and, and bring in both big fans of Oliva in and also capturing new customers, whether they're new to cigar smoking or just new to Oliva. What, what's sort of that philosophy on your events? Well, to be honest with you, it's a, it, it's always changing. You know, I mean, I remember we, we, we were the first one to, when we launched Nub to, to have a tour, you know, where we gave away a, a Mini Cooper at the end of the thing. It was all decked out in Nub. We tried to be, like, innovative in that process and, and things like that. But more importantly, we just want everybody to have a good time. You know, uh, we also believe, <laughs> I personally believe in uh, letting the, you know, letting the, the, the uh, retailer and the, and the customer to, to have a, you know, a special price that night, you know, way to, you know, to buy up, you know, so not everybody can afford a, you know, a box of Milano. They're usually, you know, maybe even smoke our Florida Olivas, but during that event, I hope that they can reach up and, and, and try the best we have, you know, um, because I think everybody should be able to enjoy, every, you know, at least one of our cigars in, in our portfolio at all times. Yeah. Awesome. Any last questions? No, Corey, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to uh, talk with us. We look forward to enjoying a cigar with you uh, in the in the future. Um, if you're, you know, next time you're in D.C. and we're, we're working to lobby Congress and the FDA, uh, we hope that you'll uh, stop by to the townhouse for a cigar. Yeah, I'll be happy to join you guys. Be yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, finally enjoy a cigar in person again. Uh, thank you, Corey, very much for uh, your time today. We appreciate it. Uh, Thank you for having me. Thank you guys for that have been on the uh, that have been watching. I, I hope you guys are all staying safe and uh, you know st be positive. And we'll be out of this thing shortly. And we'll yeah, be absolutely. Uh, we'll be ready for cigars collectively again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Keep smoking. I know it keeps mo it keeps me sane, keeps me you know relaxed, and keeps absolutely. the anxiety down. So, uh, just want to let everybody know watching as well. Uh, tomorrow we got a good one. Uh, any of our retailers that use our tobacco processing. We're going to have a good event tomorrow. We're going to have that group live. They're going to talk about some additions that are going to help retailers now with processing for things like curbside and some other stuff. So we've got some good additions there. 
Uh, we've got the author of Around the World in 80 Cigars. It's going to be on on Thursday. So that's going to be a fun conversation. And Friday, we're going to be talking all about state associations and the importance of working through the states and how to how to do that. Uh, because again, as we talked about earlier on this broadcast, we know that, that there is just going to be a tidal wave of things coming against us as legislators get state legislators come back in. So that's going to be an important one on Friday as well. So again, Corey, thank you so much. All the best to the Oliva family and the Oliva company. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Same here. Thank you guys. Take care. Bye-bye.